Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this new year, new opportunities to continue to allow you to impact and change our lives. New opportunities to walk with you in new ways. And we just ask, God, that as we gather together once again, as we study your word today and then the Sundays to come and the weeks to come, Lord, that it wouldn't just be something we do, but Lord, that we'd be engaged with your word and with you by your spirit, and you'd be speaking to us and changing us. Lord, as we're reading each day and we're starting our Bible reading plans for the year, that you'd be speaking to us. And even if it's not something magnificent every day, but we would just be disciplined to be in your word because we know that you're speaking to us as we do. Have your way in this place now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. That's just a little plug for uh, reading your Bible. Uh, it's like, it's already the 5th. I, I can't start. You can start on the 5th. You can start on the 6th. It's okay. And if you miss a day, it's okay. Right? It's not like uh, you're going to get zapped. Uh, if you want, we can arrange that. But uh, <laughs> generally speaking, just go for it. And like even days where you feel like you're just kind of reading and you didn't feel like you gained a lot, it's the cumulative work as you're in God's Word. It changes you. You're not even going to be aware of it, but it's going to change you. So get into it. Dive into it every day. Well, last week we were in Acts chapter 16, kind of a prelude to the book of Philippians, where Paul is in Philippi, brought there by a vision, um, and then things didn't go well in one regard, right? I mean, when you end up in jail, generally speaking, things are not going well. And yet, out of all of that, people get saved. God was on the move. And now, 10, 12 years later, Paul is, well, he's back in jail. It's a familiar place for him. This one's a little different. He's in Rome. He's not in a dungeon, most likely. He's most likely in a house waiting to meet with Caesar. And so he has Roman guards with him all the time. He has a captive audience. So he's given them the gospel. And guards in Caesar's household are getting saved. It's pretty cool. And he's going to write to the church in Philippi. Now, what's striking and what's different about this book compared to all of his other letters, he's not writing in response to a problem. Right? In Corinth, there's, well, too many problems to count. And Galatia and Ephesians, there's these different theological problems. There's no major problem in Philippi. He's just writing to encourage them to keep on keeping on, to keep on allowing the joy of the Lord to be their strength. To keep Jesus central in all that they say and all that they do. He's kind of like the coach of the winning team who has to kind of come up with new ways to say the same old thing. To keep motivating the team. Kind of like Golden State over the last five years. Right? They're just winning and they don't have to do it. The coach was like, pretty good at this. You know? And it was his first time coaching. His first five years of coaching, he just, like, they're cleaning up. So he had to come up with new ways to motivate and to keep them moving and going in the right direction. Well, that's what Paul's doing with the church in Philippi. Having to give them the good news, and in a way that, hey, you already know this stuff, just a little more encouragement. Keep on, keep on going forward. Now, the theme of this book, as you may already know, is joy. Writing from prison, from jail, he's saying joy, and that's the whole outlook and the focus of the book. Yeah. It's because circumstance doesn't have to dictate life for you. In fact, one commentator said it this way, Philippians is seen as the happiest book of the Bible, yet it was written in the prison. Your circumstance does not determine your joy. Too often, it does. Well, pause that for a second. Where is Philippi? You're like, I don't know. Well, I do. It's, <laughs> it's, it's here, in Europe. Now, it looks like it's not Europe. And it looks like it's all connected, but there's actually a break between Asia on the right and Europe on the left. It's a very small break, but there is a break. And so Paul's up there in Philippi. It's the first church in Europe, Macedonia at the time. Yeah. And this theme of joy, well, it's an amazing kind of deal when you think about it. Because we allow circumstance to often dictate our happiness and therefore our joy. 
And that's missing the whole point of what joy is. It's something deeper. It's something fuller that God does in us and through us. It's not what we've created. John MacArthur says it this way, Joy is a gift from God to those who believe the gospel of Christ being produced in them by the Holy Spirit because they receive and obey the word of God while experiencing trials and keeping their hope fixed on the glory which is to come. Joy is determined by what Jesus has done for us and whose we are, as we'll see here this morning. But just for fun, uh, here's some things about joy in the season that has passed that maybe you've experienced. So, 88% of people feel stressed during the holidays. Check. Uh, 56% of people bite their lips with family during the holidays. You're like, okay, I can't say that, right? Because there's only three topics you have to avoid. Politics, personal matters, and religion with your family. So you're talking about the weather most of the time. The average couple has seven arguments during the holidays, which I thought was kind of low. Uh, <laughs> but from experience, because look at top five holiday arguments. Where to go, money, family, cleaning up, and cooking. There's five arguments right there. So easy to add another two or three. 85% of people overeat during the holidays. I want to ask you to raise your hands. 42% uh, of people unbutton their pants after a holiday meal. Definitely do not raise your hand. Uh, we don't want to know. Joy depended on circumstance so often, and yet as we jump into this book, joy is not going to be dependent on circumstance. It's dependent on what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul's going to remind them of. And first he's going to remind them and tell them who they are. So we pick it up in verse 1. Well, before we pick it up in verse 1, just one more verse I wanted to share. Because Jesus talked about joy. John 15, 11, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. The Christian life is the joy-filled life. It's not to be the Eeyore kind of life, right? Mm -hmm. It's to be joy-filled because Jesus is in our heart and in our life. One commentator said, Joy is the flag that flies in the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. Joy is the flag that flies on the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. The verb to rejoice appears 74 times in the New Testament. Joy, 59 times. In other words, this should be the normal for our lives. And if it hasn't been in 2019 and previous years, 2020 is the time to make it a new word and a new outlook for your life. Joy-centered, joy-filled. Why? Because of what God has done and what Jesus has done in and for your life. Your life is to be filled with joy. You're like, I don't know. Well, we will see. That's what Jesus' heart is for us. So if his heart is for that, if Paul then writes a letter from prison, talking about being content in prison, you're like, what? He's got something that we're missing. Oftentimes, as we wait for circumstances to change, we wait for things to get better so we can feel happy. Joy is so much deeper, so much more lasting. Verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, who you are. You could also write whose you are. We know who Paul is, right? Acts chapter 8 was his story where he's on the way to kill and gather Christians in Damascus and arrest them and kill some uh, if he was lucky. And instead Jesus appears to him and changes his life forever. Transformation. That's why we talk about transformation a lot because that's what's supposed to happen in our lives. We're supposed to be going in one direction and then we're transformed to go in another direction. We were going Satan's way, now we're going God's way. It's a different thing. And in the book of Acts, several times, he recounts his testimony and becomes a missionary, an apostle, and starts all these churches. Timothy appears on the scene in Acts chapter 16. He's called a son in the faith. First and second Timothy are written by Paul to Timothy as he's a young pastor needing encouragement. Paul and Timothy, servants, of Christ Jesus. Servants? It's a good way to think about yourself. 
And so Paul and Timothy, they, they don't have to, he doesn't have to write Paul an apostle. Maybe that strikes you. Remember when we've gone through Galatians and Ephesians, he had to write Paul the apostle. Why? Because there's no issue here. They're under his authority. They recognize him as an apostle. He doesn't have to declare it. He doesn't have to prove it. They already are saying, hey, we're with you, Paul, in mind, body, and spirit. Being a servant. Jesus, it says in Matthew chapter 20, even as the Son of Man came not to be saved, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So often we think of ourselves first. And so it becomes, how do I feel? How am I being served? How am I? And, and then from that we proceed to interact with people. And the servant attitude, the bond slave attitude that we're to have in Christ Jesus is just the opposite. It's not about how we get served, how we feel special. It's how we can make others feel special. How we can serve one another. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. You can try to put your name there. How's that going? Are you a servant of Christ Jesus? You're like, well, yeah, when I come and I, I, I do these things, I serve in the church, so I'm a servant. Yeah, but you can do something over here and not be a servant over here. Now you've lost it. You, you're kind of split. You're a hypocrite, almost. You're like, oh, I don't like that. Being a servant is modeling our lives after Jesus. We came not to be served, but to serve. Then he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. You're like, well, now I know it's not talking about me. But if you're in Christ Jesus, you're a saint. Now, if you were a Catholic and you wanted to become a saint, you've got a different <coughs> issue. First, you have to be a Catholic. Then you have to die. Good start. Uh, and then a local devotion grows up in your memory. Your life is investigated. Your local bishop sends your case to the Vatican. Then you pray for a miracle. Well, not you, because you're dead. Uh, the Vatican investigates the miraculous. The Vatican declares you blessed. Pray for another miracle. And then you're a saint. And you can be venerated. You know, you can have a holiday. You can be a patron. Name schools after you, churches. So that's the process if you're in the Catholic Church to be a saint. But... Paul is saying, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. What do you mean then? Those that have gone through that process and have waited and have been approved by the church in Rome? No. It means all those in Christ Jesus. It means all of us. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're a saint, not an ain't. You're in Christ Jesus, you're a saint. You're like, I don't feel very saintly. Well, that's true. A lot of times we don't. But here's the thing. 300 times the Bible refers to sinners... Three times possibly in the New Testament in reference to Christians. Only three times. Zero times the use of sin in reference to Christians in Philippians. 200 plus times the Bible calls Christians saints, holy, or righteous. Saints, holy, or righteous. Why? Because who you once were is not who you are now in Christ Jesus. You're a saint. So here's six things that kind of maybe will help in that. Number one, sin may describe some of your activity, but does not define your entire identity in Christ. You will sin some of the time, but you are a saint all of the time in Christ. Sin is some of what you do, but not the totality of who you are in Christ. Number four, there is a big difference between having sin and being sin. Because you have a new identity as saint, you can have a new victory over sin in Christ. And number six, as a sinner, you have a dark past. As a saint, you have a bright future. He's writing this letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus. That means if you have surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ and invited him to be Lord and Savior of your life, to forgive you of your sins, you're a saint. Irregardless of how you feel and what others think about you, you're positionally a saint. Practically, then, we have to live up to it. Practically, then, the Bible tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. There's parts for us to do, of course, but positionally, you're a saint. I'm a saint. You're like, eh. Sometimes we don't act very saintly. 
And yet, overall, having that mindset reminds us of what Jesus has done for us. Having that understanding helps us move forward when things aren't going the way we think they should go. Helps us when we have struggles and problems and we mess up, we have to come back to, okay, I am a saint. What does that mean? Go through a list. What does that mean? I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm adopted. And go, go through these things that we saw in Ephesians about who you are in Christ. The past is the past. Never more true here today. Because we begin a new year, a new decade, some would say. You know, depending on how you do time wise, right? We have a bright future. We're saints. Notice there's nothing about what we have done to earn it. Right? You're a saint. Why? Because Ephesians 2 tells us we've been saved by grace. You've been saved. Not by works, lest anyone would boast. Our works don't make us a saint. Jesus makes us a saint by grace. But guess what? Ephesians 2.10 says he's got things planned for us to do. Oh. So then we work out and we work for, not for our salvation, we work from our salvation as saints, we're working for God. You're on His team. You're like, the question only is, how well is that going? Right? Are, are you living up to whose you are? You're a saint. Right along that should be a servant. Th that's who we are in Christ Jesus. Saints and servants. With the overseers and the deacons. He's writing to the leadership and to the people. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always in this order because you have to receive the grace of God before you can know the peace of God. Verse 3. I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He's thankful to God. He's talking about them, but he's thankful to God. It's an interesting kind of way to look at things. Right? It's thankful for what they have done, but ultimately the thanksgiving goes to God. Why? Because that's how our lives are supposed to be. Our, the glory that we would receive is supposed to be because of Him and for Him. And so glory should be deflected and deferred and passed on to God. If we're living as saints, glory goes to God. It's like, wow, look at them. They're doing great. They're walking, and they're stumbling at times, but they're getting back up, and they're growing and maturing in their faith. Paul is thankful to God. For what? Every time he remembers them. He prays for them with joy. Sitting there in prison. He's got time. <laughs> Nothing but time. And so he's praying for these churches and these people. And they have an interesting relationship with the church in Philippi. He says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Partnership? What is that? It's this joining together, this band together, this working side by side. And in their case, well, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where it tells us that they were part of giving to his ministry. And in chapter 9 as well, 2 Corinthians. And as he writes about these things, he says, these guys weren't the rich, but they were willing to sacrifice for the work of the gospel. And they've partnered with Paul from the beginning. So as he helped start the church, and then he moved on, and they kept in touch, they send finances, and they were supporting, and so they become partners like we're partners with Ryan and Annabelle as they're getting ready to go to Mozambique, right? Or with other ministries where we support people and uh, different groups and different people in missions. We're partners. Even though we're not going, we get to partake in the blessing. We get to be part of the ministry. And as we give to the body of Christ here locally and see what God is doing here, here and around the world, we're partnering together. It's a wonderful thing to see God work and move as we partner for the gospel's sake. He's thankful to God. When you're thankful to God, it leads to joy. 
Right? When you're having that heart and that mindset of thankfulness and gratefulness, you're like, oh, it's so good. He's just thinking about these guys. Oh, you guys are so good. It's so fun. I miss you guys. You know, and he's just, he's got love for them. So he says in verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God's not finished. With you, with you, with you, with you, with you. God's not finished. If you're looking for verses to memorize in 2020, there's going to be a ton here in the book of Philippians. There'll be another one next week. There'll be some in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And chapter, like You could just go through and memorize six or eight verses in this book. And you could almost memorize. You could maybe do the whole book. Uh, it's not very long. But you could do verses. And this is one of those verses. Why? Because it does a couple things for us. It gives us assurance and a promise. Assurance? Yeah. He says, I'm sure of this. I have no doubt. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God's going to finish what he started. Now, we won't ask for a show of hands, but how many people have projects at home that are not done? Right? You've got a list this long and a completion rate that is a little shorter. Right? Because we, we intend to, but we don't always get to. We, we plan, but not always finish. You're like, no, no. When I do, I finish. Well, good. That's good. That's not true for everybody. Right? Sometimes there's things you intend to do and you don't do. Never happens with God. All that He intends to do, He finishes. That includes you and me. He's working on us. And that doesn't mean go out and get a bumper sticker. You know, don't be patient with me. God's still working on me. Don't put that on your car. <laughs> if you have it on your car, it race. Why? Because you think it's an excuse to drive terrible. It's not. It's an excuse to get pulled over. Right? Because if you say, oh, God's still working on me. That's why I have this problem. No, no it's, not, it's not an excuse. It's a reality. God's still working on you to complete something in you. So when? Till the day of Christ. So you don't look at it in the negative. Look at it in the positive. God's working on me. I'm a construction zone, but it's an active construction zone. In other words, you don't just sit on the sidelines and wait. You get involved in the game. You get involved in life. And in that, it's messy at times. Why? Because, well, if you've gone to a construction zone, it's not always clean and prim and proper. Depending on, especially the people working on the construction zone, it could be a mess. You're like, how is anything getting done here? Someone should clean up. And they're like, that's you. You're like, oh. And you got to wear a hard hat. Why? Because things could fall. And you got to have steel-toed shoes. And you got to be protected. Why? Because anything could happen. Well, that's life. God's in that process of working things out and completing in us. But it doesn't get to a point where, you know, you reach a certain age and you're like, oh, God's probably finished with me, you know, because I'm so old. <laughs> you know, uh, no. He's going to keep working on you until Jesus returns. So there's no point where you go, well, I'm done, I've learned all I need to learn, or I've loved all I need to love, as we'll see in a moment, or, you know, I've, I've done so many good things, so I think God's done with me. No, it's ongoing. And so if you're waiting to serve, you're waiting to do good works, you're waiting to, to jump in here or jump in there until God works out more in you, uh, bad idea. That's an ongoing process for the rest of your life. It's sanctification, where the God is working in us to make us more like His Son, Jesus. The idea is we keep moving in His direction, right? And He keeps working on us. It's an active construction zone. Often we kind of sit on the sidelines and think, God, you keep working on me. He's like, get in the game, I'll keep working on you. Uh, I'd rather just watch. I'd, I'd rather just sit. No, no, no. You've got things to say. You've got a life to lead. You've got a light to shine. God will do His part. I am sure of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry. You don't have to wonder. Has God got me? If you're wondering about it, here's the answer. He's got you. In fact, here's a few more verses. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. 
Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end. I can't go on. He will sustain you to the end. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That's why you fall back to this. You're a saint. Because when you're not acting saintly, you can wonder. People can try to poke at you and try to say to you, hey, you're not really a very good Christian. The enemy will come and say, you're a lousy Christian. You haven't even opened your Bible in six weeks. You're a lousy Christian. You've never even shared the gospel. You're a lousy Christian. And, and you just like get beat down. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm a saint. And I'm under construction. So it's messy. But God's still working on me. I'm moving in the right direction. And so I'm going to get back up. I'm going to keep moving forward. Because God's going to finish what he started. That's a promise. And if you're in a place where you're, you're trying to figure this whole thing out, and taste and see, the Bible says. Just check it out. Go, hey God, if you're real, if this is all really true, I'm going to surrender my life to you. I'm going to start reading this Bible thing. And I don't even get it. I'm going to surrender and watch and see. Are you going to do anything? Is my life going to be any different? Watch and see. He's going to be faithful to complete what he started in you. He's letting them know that. He's like, guys, it's going to be good. No matter what's coming down the road, God's going to work in and through you. It says in verse 7, it's, Right for me to feel this way about you all, because he's from the south. No. Uh, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Number four, keep growing. Right? There's no major problem, so he's got, oh, what can I do? I want to encourage them to keep growing. In what way? In love. He says, I, I got every right to be so excited for you guys and so confident of this for you guys. Why? Because I've seen you in action. We've been partners in the gospel. I know your heart. And so I'm so excited. And I love you so much. That's what he's saying. He's like, if there's a better church out there, I have never heard of it. Right? This is amazing. You guys are awesome because you're following Christ. And we're partnering together. That's a great feeling. I kind of feel that way. That we are partnering together and God's doing a work. And we're growing and maturing in Christ. And it's a beautiful thing. Oh, I can look back, and there were some days where I thought, oh man, God, what are you doing? Are you even working? Is anything really happening? I mean, God, this is just, oh hey. And yet, God's at work. And I can say, hey, we've been partners. God's at work in us and through us, and it's good. And so Paul's prayer. Whenever you hear that Paul is praying, you're like, ooh, what's he going to say? What kind of prayer? Right? Prayers in the Bible are something to take note of. It's to help you pray. It's to help me pray. Because sometimes, you know, you're like, what do I pray about? I don't know. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray. You know, that, that gets old really quick. You know, that's a good starter prayer if you're six. Uh, but as you get older, you know, your prayer has to evolve. You have to kind of grow and mature in your faith. It's my prayer that your love may abound more and more. That your love may abound. Part of being the church means we get to practice loving one another. That's where love is supposed to start. Love one another. The world will know that you're Christians by your love for one another. They're like, oh, but I don't even know anybody. Oh, I guess there's a problem then. I guess you probably should stick around for potluck. Talk to some people. He's probably coming. Call up some people and say, can we get coffee together? Can we go for a run? Can we go you know, for a hike? And, and Why? So you can practice loving one another. 
And then you can take that home. Like, I'm going to love my family? Oh. Yep. And then guess what? You get to love those people outside of that circle even. Oh. His prayer for them is that their love would abound. Not just like a little love. Bounding love. It's overflowing. It's like the rivers at floodplain. Like, just out of control kind of love. That should characterize us as believers. Loving and overflowing. Right? We're not worried about, oh, I've loved enough. I'm, I'm all loved up. Right? I've, I've reached my limit of love. I can't get any more. You keep loving. Yeah, but they're not reciprocating. It doesn't matter. You're a servant. Who cares? It's not up to you how people receive the love. If you're a servant, because you're a saint, you know you're in Christ, so you have his love to shine through you. It's just not even your love. You're just a receptacle and a receiver and a passer on. So thank you. Giving it out. Love in, love out. If you just keep the love to yourself, you get spiritually fat. Not faithful, available, teachable, just dead. See. Not good. We need to let it flow out and let that love abound. But this love is to have knowledge and discernment so that you can approve what is excellent. In other words, there's truth behind our love. There's purpose behind our love. It's not just, oh, lovey, lovey. Uh, there's something to it. It's sincere. Sincere. One commentator, one translation would be tested by sunlight. The Christian that's sincere in love is not afraid to stand in the light. Hmm. Our English word for sincere comes out of the Latin word, which means unadulterated, pure, unmixed. That's the kind of love we're to have. That's what he's asking. It's for this maturing Christian character to shine forth from us. That we be without offense till the day of Christ. It means in our love for others, we're not making others stumble. And it's reflected in how we live because we're a saint. So we wouldn't be ashamed if Jesus returned at that moment. That's what a growing love changes. It changes us and it changes how we view others. It's being sincere. In those days, it would be... Uh, Without wax. Without wax? Yeah. So if you had a little tiny idol, which you shouldn't, but if you did, and it got chipped and broken, you took it in, and it, hey, we'll fix it for you. Low, low price. You're like, ooh, okay. And, and, and what, how they fixed it was they took some wax, and they put it in, heat it up a little, make it look nice, paint it over. You're like, ooh, very good job. And then you're like, wait a minute. As you put it back in your little place of prominence in your house, and it's by a candle, all of a sudden your little idol goes, starts to melt. Why? Because it was insincere. It wasn't solid. It was fake. Our love shouldn't be fake. There's things our love should not be. Right? There's, there's expressions of love that are not good. You're like, what? Expressions of love that are outside of marriage. That's not okay. You're like, well, it's still love. It's, it's not. No. It's insincere. It's not according to God. It's not pure. It's unadulterated. It's mixed. Oh. I mean, God cares about the kind of love we have? Yeah. So when it comes to marriage, he says, love is between a man and a woman who are married. Not just any man or any woman will do. Uh, the one you're married to, right? Oh. Yeah. And, and if you're a child, to love and honor your parents means love and honor your parents. That's loving in word and deed. Oh. So it's not loving to be disobedient. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> love has so many things to it, right? And we could easily go through all the things it's not supposed to be. But a great way is, of course, go to 1 Corinthians 13. And what is love? And we're going to sing about it at the end here. And put your name there. Ooh. That's a tough one. And then you realize, I definitely am under construction. But see, we don't just get like, oh, I'm forever under construction, so it don't matter. It's, it matters because something's being built in me. 
and it, it's growing and I'm changing. So yeah, I'm a mess, but I'm three or four stories up. You know, I'm growing, I'm changing, and being strengthened. The goal is to be sincere and without offense, that we be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Bearing fruit is what matters. Jesus talks about that in John 15. Bearing fruit is the result of abiding in the vine. Staying close to Jesus will bear fruit in our lives. It's not like you have to work if you're an apple on an apple tree, right? You don't have to like strain at the end, like, you know, I'm trying to grow. The sap just runs and you just grow. Oh, the same happens spiritually when we're just in Christ, which you are if you're a saint, and you allow his love to infect you in a good way, and you just walk with him. His, his life and his love are in you and will live out through you. And it will be evident to people around you. How you speak, how you live, it will be different. It will be changed and transformed. Not because you try harder, because you surrender more. And as you do that, God is glorified. As we're filled with the fruit of righteousness, we be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Not pure and perfect. Like, I'll never get there then if I have to be perfect. Well, the idea of pure and blameless for the day of Christ, proving what is excellent there in verse 10, it's not, oh, I have to be perfect, so if I'm not perfect, then I should just toss it all in. No, it's positionally, remember, you're a saint who sometimes sins. You're not a sinner who sometimes gets it right. You're a saint who sometimes sins. Notice, sometimes sins, right? You're not like a sin practicer. Right? You're not trying to get better at sinning. You're trying to practice righteousness, right? So what you practice, you get better at. If you practice sinning, you'll get better at sinning, right? If you lie and you keep lying, you'll get eventually better at it. You're like, really? That's not a good thing, right? If you practice righteousness, you'll get better at it. Not because you're better, but Jesus is better. And you allow his love to work in and through you. It's a wonderful thing. You'll be sincere. You'll be without offense. Blameless. Why? Because God will look at you through Christ. He'll understand. He'll see you perfect because of the cross. Because of the blood of Jesus. That's what we're going to remember at the communion. What Jesus has done makes us blameless. Makes us pure. Now we just get to live it out. And we do it imperfectly. But we keep moving forward. For the glory and praise of God. So who are you? Whose are you? If you have that assurance that God has you, are you living sincerely in Christ, for Christ? Is his love in you being radiated from you? You're like, I'd probably do better. Just think, are you being sincere? Are you being real with the people around you? Go back to whose you are. You're a saint. And then get that mindset that you're a servant. Why? Because if you have the mindset that you're a servant and a saint, it means positionally I understand I'm in Christ as a saint. Practically it means I'm submitted to him. And so it doesn't matter what people do to me. It doesn't matter how the circumstances around me are. I'm going to be a servant to those around me because it's really ultimately for God. It's ultimately for Jesus. And so that's an expression of his love in and through me. And his love will abound in me. It's knowledgeable. It's sincere. It's pure. It's holy. Not because I've got it all together and I'm perfect, but I understand whose I am and which direction I'm going. Let's pray.